Fascism is a form of radical authoritarian ultranationalism, characterized by dictatorial power, forcible suppression of opposition and strong regimentation of society and of the economy, which came to prominence in early 20th century Europe. The first fascist movements emerged in Italy during World War I before it spread to other European countries. Opposed to liberalism, Marxism, and anarchism, fascism is placed on the far right within the traditional left right spectrum. Fascists saw World War I as a revolution that brought massive changes to the nature of war, society, the state, and technology. The advent of total war and the total mass mobilization of society had broken down the distinction between civilians and combatants. A military citizenship arose in which all citizens were involved with the military in some manner during the war. The war had resulted in the rise of a powerful state capable of mobilizing millions of people to serve on the front lines and providing economic production and logistics to support them, as well as having unprecedented authority to intervene in the lives of citizens. Fascists believe that liberal democracy is obsolete and they regard the complete mobilization of society under a totalitarian one party state as necessary to prepare a nation for armed conflict and to respond effectively to economic difficulties. Such a state is led by a strong leader such as a dictator and a martial government composed of the members of the governing fascist party to forge national unity and maintain a stable and orderly society fascism rejects assertions that violence is automatically negative in nature and views political violence war and imperialism as means that can achieve national rejuvenation fascists advocate a mixed economy with the principal goal of achieving autarky national economic self-sufficiency through protectionist and interventionist economic policies since the end of world war ii in 1945 few parties have openly described themselves as fascist and the term is instead now usually used pejoratively by political opponents the descriptions neo-fascist or post-fascist are sometimes applied more formally to describe parties of the far right with ideologies similar to, or rooted in, 20th-century fascist movements. Etymology <inaudible> 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 The Italian term fascismo is derived from fascio meaning a bundle of rods, ultimately from the Latin word fasces. This was the name given to political organizations in Italy known as fasci, groups similar to guilds or syndicates. According to Mussolini's own account, the Fascist Revolutionary Party Partito Fascista Revolutionario or PFR was founded in Italy in 1915. In 1919, Mussolini founded the Fasci Italiani di Combattimento in Milan, which became the Partito Nazionale Fascista National Fascist Party two years later. The fascists came to associate the term with the ancient Roman fasces or fascio littorio, a bundle of rods tied around an axe, an ancient Roman symbol of the authority of the civic magistrate carried by his lictors, which could be used for corporal and capital punishment at his command. The symbolism of the fasces suggested strength through unity. A single rod is easily broken, while the bundle is difficult to break. Similar symbols were developed by different fascist movements, for example, the phalange symbol is five arrows joined together by a yoke. <laughs> <laughs> Definitions Historians, political scientists and other scholars have long debated the exact nature of fascism. Each group described as fascist has at least some unique elements, and many definitions of fascism have been criticized as either too wide or narrow. One common definition of the term focuses on three concepts. The fascist negations anti-liberalism, anti-communism and anti-conservatism. Nationalist authoritarian goals of creating a regulated economic structure to transform social relations within a modern, self-determined culture, and a political aesthetic of romantic symbolism, mass mobilization, a positive view of violence and promotion of masculinity, youth and charismatic leadership. According to many scholars, fascism especially once in power has historically attacked communism, conservatism, and parliamentary liberalism, attracting support primarily from the far right. Roger Griffin describes fascism as a genus of political ideology whose mythic core in its various permutations is a palingenetic form of populist ultranationalism." Griffin describes the ideology as having three core components, I, the rebirth myth, e, populist ultranationalism and e, the myth of decadence. Fascism is 
a genuinely revolutionary, trans-class form of anti-liberal, and in the last analysis, anti-conservative nationalism", built on a complex range of theoretical and cultural influences. He distinguishes an interwar period in which it manifested itself in elite-led but populist, armed party, politics opposing socialism and liberalism and promising radical politics to rescue the nation from decadence. Robert Paxton says that fascism is a form of political behavior marked by obsessive preoccupation with community decline, humiliation, or victimhood and by compensatory cults of unity, energy, and purity, in which a mass-based party of committed nationalist militants, working in uneasy but effective collaboration with traditional elites, abandons democratic liberties and pursues with redemptive violence and without ethical or legal restraints goals of internal cleansing and external expansion. Umberto Eco, Kevin Possmore, John Weiss, Ian Adams and Moira Grant mention racism as a characteristic component of fascism, e.g. how the fascistic dictator Adolf Hitler idealized German society as a racially unified and hierarchically organized Volksgemeinschaft construct. Fascist philosophies vary by application, but remain distinct by one theoretic commonality. All traditionally fall into the far right sector of any political spectrum, catalyzed by afflicted class identities over conventional social inequities. John Luckix, Hungarian American historian and Holocaust survivor, argues that there is no such thing as generic fascism. He claims that national socialism and communism are essentially manifestations of populism and that states such as National Socialist Germany and Fascist Italy are more different than similar. Topic. Position in the political spectrum Most scholars place fascism on the far right of the political spectrum. Such scholarship focuses on its social conservatism and its authoritarian means of opposing egalitarianism. Roderick Stackelberg places fascism—including Nazism, which he says is a radical variant of fascism—on the political right by explaining the more a person deems absolute equality among all people to be a desirable condition, the further left he or she will be on the ideological spectrum. The more a person considers inequality to be unavoidable or even desirable, the further to the right he or she will be. Fascism's origins, however, are complex and include many seemingly contradictory viewpoints, ultimately centered around a myth of national rebirth from decadence. Fascism was founded during World War I by Italian national syndicalists who drew upon both left wing organizational tactics and right wing political views. Italian fascism gravitated to the right in the early 1920s. A major element of fascist ideology that has been deemed to be far right is its stated goal to promote the right of a supposedly superior people to dominate, while purging society of supposedly inferior elements. In the 1920s, the Italian fascists described their ideology as right wing in the political program The Doctrine of Fascism, stating, We are free to believe that this is the century of authority, a century tending to the right, a fascist century. Mussolini stated that fascism's position on the political spectrum was not a serious issue for fascists. Fascism, sitting on the right, could also have sat on the mountain of the center. These words in any case do not have a fixed and unchanged meaning, they do have a variable subject to location, time and spirit. We don't give a damn about these empty terminologies and we despise those who are terrorized by these words. Major Italian groups politically on the right, especially rich landowners and big business, feared an uprising by groups on the left such as sharecroppers and labor unions. They welcomed fascism and supported its violent suppression of opponents on the left. The accommodation of the political right into the Italian fascist movement in the early 1920s created internal factions within the movement. The fascist left included Michel Bianchi, Giuseppe Battai, Angelo Olivero Olivetti, Sergio Pannunzio and Edmondo Rizzoni, who were committed to advancing national syndicalism as a replacement for parliamentary liberalism in order to modernize the economy and advance the interests of workers and common people. The «fascist right» included members of the paramilitary squadristi and former members of the Italian Nationalist Association ANI. 
The Squadristi wanted to establish fascism as a complete dictatorship, while the former ANI members, including Alfredo Rocco, sought to institute an authoritarian corporatist state to replace the liberal state in Italy while retaining the existing elites. Upon accommodating the political right, there arose a group of monarchist fascists who sought to use fascism to create an absolute monarchy under King Victor Emmanuel III of Italy. After King Victor Emmanuel III forced Mussolini to resign as head of government and placed him under arrest in 1943, Mussolini was rescued by German forces. While continuing to rely on Germany for support, Mussolini and the remaining loyal fascists founded the Italian Social Republic with Mussolini as head of state. Mussolini sought to re-radicalize Italian fascism, declaring that the fascist state had been overthrown because Italian fascism had been subverted by Italian conservatives and the bourgeoisie. Then the new fascist government proposed the creation of workers' councils and profit-sharing in industry, although the German authorities, who effectively controlled northern Italy at this point, ignored these measures and did not seek to enforce them. A number of post-World War II fascist movements described themselves as a third position outside the traditional political spectrum. Spanish phalangist leader José Antonio Primo de Rivera said, b. A sickly the right stands for the maintenance of an economic structure, albeit an unjust one, while the left stands for the attempt to subvert that economic structure, even though the subversion thereof would entail the destruction of much that was worthwhile. Fascist. As a pejorative The term, fascist, has been used as a pejorative, regarding varying movements across the far right of the political spectrum. George Orwell wrote in 1944 that, The word, fascism, is almost entirely meaningless. Almost any English person would accept, bully, as a synonym for, fascist. Communist states have sometimes been referred to as, fascist typically as an insult. For example, it has been applied to Marxist regimes in Cuba under Fidel Castro and Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh. Chinese Marxists used the term to denounce the Soviet Union during the Sino-Soviet split and likewise the Soviets used the term to denounce Chinese Marxists and social democracy coining a new term in social fascism. In the United States, Herbert Matthews of the New York Times asked in 1946. Should we now place Stalinist Russia in the same category as Hitlerite Germany? Should we say that she is fascist? J. Edgar Hoover, longtime FBI director and ardent anti-communist, wrote extensively of Red Fascism. The Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s was sometimes called fascist. Historian Peter Amon states that Undeniably, the Klan had some traits in common with European fascism chauvinism, racism, a mystique of violence, an affirmation of a certain kind of archaic traditionalism yet their differences were fundamental. The KKK never envisioned a change of political or economic system." Professor Richard Griffiths of the University of Wales wrote in 2005 that, "...fascism is the most misused, and overused word, of our times. Fascist is sometimes applied to post-World War II organizations and ways of thinking that academics more commonly term neo-fascist. History Nineteenth century roots According to Encyclopædia Britannica the roots of fascism are either tied to the Jacobin movement or a 19th-century backlash against the Enlightenment. Historians such as Irene Collins and Howard C. Payne see Napoleon III, who ran a «police state» and suppressed the media, as a forerunner of fascism. According to David Thompson, the Italian Risorgimento of 1871 led to the «nemesis of fascism». William L. Shirer sees a continuity from the views of Fichte and Hegel, through Bismarck, to Hitler. Robert Gerwerth speaks of a direct line from Bismarck to Hitler. Julian Dierkes sees fascism as a particularly violent form of imperialism. Fan de siècle era and the fusion of Morrisism with Sorelianism.
The historian Zeev Sternhull has traced the ideological roots of fascism back to the 1880s and in particular to the fin de siècle theme of that time. The theme was based on a revolt against materialism, rationalism, positivism, bourgeois society and democracy. The fin de siècle generation supported emotionalism, irrationalism, subjectivism and vitalism. The fin de siècle mindset saw civilization as being in a crisis that required a massive and total solution. The fin de siècle intellectual school considered the individual only one part of the larger collectivity, which should not be viewed as an atomized numerical sum of individuals. They condemned the rationalistic individualism of liberal society and the dissolution of social links in bourgeois society. The fin de siècle outlook was influenced by various intellectual developments, including Darwinian biology, Wagnerian aesthetics, Arthur de Gobineau's racialism, Gustave Le Bon's psychology, and the philosophies of Friedrich Nietzsche, Fyodor Dostoevsky, and Henri Bergson. Social Darwinism, which gained widespread acceptance, made no distinction between physical and social life, and viewed the human condition as being an unceasing struggle to achieve the survival of the fittest. Social Darwinism challenged positivism's claim of deliberate and rational choice as the determining behavior of humans, with Social Darwinism focusing on heredity, race, and environment. Social Darwinism's emphasis on biogroup identity and the role of organic relations within societies fostered legitimacy and appeal for nationalism. New theories of social and political psychology also rejected the notion of human behavior being governed by rational choice and instead claimed that emotion was more influential in political issues than reason. Nietzsche's argument that, God is dead, coincided with his attack on the herd mentality. Of Christianity, democracy, and modern collectivism, his concept of the Ubermensch, and his advocacy of the will to power as a primordial instinct, were major influences upon many of the fin de siècle generation. Bergson's claim of the existence of an Elan vital or vital instinct centered upon free choice and rejected the processes of materialism and determinism. This challenged Marxism. Gaetano Mosca, in his work The Ruling Class, 1896, developed the theory that claims that in all societies an organized minority will dominate and rule over the disorganized majority. Mosca claims that there are only two classes in society, the governing, the organized minority, and the governed, the disorganized majority. He claims that the organized nature of the organized minority makes it irresistible to any individual of the disorganized majority. The anarchist Mikhail Bakunin's concept of propaganda of the deed, which stressed the importance of direct action as the primary means of politics, including revolutionary violence, became popular among fascists who admired the concept and adopted it as a part of fascism. French nationalist and reactionary monarchist Charles Maurras influenced fascism. Moras promoted what he called integral nationalism, which called for the organic unity of a nation and Moras insisted that a powerful monarch was an ideal leader of a nation. Moras distrusted what he considered the democratic mystification of the popular will that created an impersonal collective subject. He claimed that a powerful monarch was a personified sovereign who could exercise authority to unite a nation's people. Morris's integral nationalism was idealized by fascists, but modified into a modernized revolutionary form that was devoid of Morris's monarchism. French revolutionary syndicalist Georges Sorel promoted the legitimacy of political violence in his work Reflections on Violence and other works in which he advocated radical syndicalist action to achieve a revolution to overthrow capitalism and the bourgeoisie through a general strike. In Reflections on Violence, Sorrell emphasized need for a revolutionary political religion. Also in his work The Illusions of Progress, Sorrell denounced democracy as reactionary, saying, Nothing is more aristocratic than democracy. By 1909 after the failure of a syndicalist general strike in France, Sorrell and his supporters left the radical left and went to the radical right, where they sought to merge militant Catholicism and French patriotism with their views advocating anti-Republican Christian French patriots as ideal revolutionaries. Initially Sorrell had officially been a revisionist of Marxism, but by 1910 announced his abandonment of socialist literature and claimed in 1914, using an aphorism of Benedetto Croce that socialism is dead because of the decomposition of Marxism. Sorrell became a supporter of reactionary Maurassian nationalism beginning in 1909 that influenced his works. Morris held interest in merging his nationalist ideals with Sorelian syndicalism as a means to confront democracy. Morris stated, 
A socialism liberated from the democratic and cosmopolitan element fits nationalism well as a well-made glove fits a beautiful hand." The fusion of Maurassian nationalism and Sorelian syndicalism influenced radical Italian nationalist Enrico Corradini. Corradini spoke of the need for a nationalist syndicalist movement, led by elitist aristocrats and anti-democrats who shared a revolutionary syndicalist commitment to direct action and a willingness to fight. Corradini spoke of Italy as being a «proletarian nation» that needed to pursue imperialism in order to challenge the «plutocratic» French and British. Corradini's views were part of a wider set of perceptions within the right-wing Italian Nationalist Association which claimed that Italy's economic backwardness was caused by corruption in its political class, liberalism, and division caused by «ignoble socialism». The ANI held ties and influence among conservatives, Catholics and the business community. Italian national syndicalists held a common set of principles, the rejection of bourgeois values, democracy, liberalism, Marxism, internationalism and pacifism, and the promotion of heroism, vitalism and violence. The ANI claimed that liberal democracy was no longer compatible with the modern world, and advocated a strong state and imperialism, claiming that humans are naturally predatory and that nations were in a constant struggle, in which only the strongest could survive. Futurism was both an artistic cultural movement and initially a political movement in Italy led by Filippo Tommaso Marinetti who founded the Futurist Manifesto 1908, that championed the causes of modernism, action, and political violence as necessary elements of politics while denouncing liberalism and parliamentary politics. Marinetti rejected conventional democracy based on majority rule and egalitarianism, for a new form of democracy, promoting what he described in his work the futurist conception of democracy", as the following, "...we are therefore able to give the directions to create and to dismantle to numbers, to quantity, to the mass, for with us number, quantity and mass will never be—as they are in Germany and Russia—the number, quantity and mass of mediocre men, incapable and indecisive." Futurism influenced fascism in its emphasis on recognizing the virile nature of violent action and war as being necessities of modern civilization. Marinetti promoted the need of physical training of young men, saying that in male education, gymnastics should take precedence over books, and he advocated segregation of the genders on this matter, in that womanly sensibility must not enter men's education whom Marinetti claimed must be "...lively, bellicose, muscular and violently dynamic." Topic: World War One and its aftermath, 1914 to 1929. At the outbreak of World War One in August 1914, the Italian political left became severely split over its position on the war. The Italian Socialist Party opposed the war, but a number of Italian revolutionary syndicalists supported war against Germany and Austria-Hungary on the grounds that their reactionary regimes had to be defeated to ensure the success of socialism. Angelo Olivero Olivetti formed a pro-interventionist fascio called the Fasci of International Action in October 1914. Benito Mussolini upon being expelled from his position as chief editor of the PSI's newspaper Avanti, for his anti-German stance, joined the interventionist cause in a separate fascio. The term, fascism, was first used in 1915 by members of Mussolini's movement, the Fasci of Revolutionary Action. The first meeting of the Fasci of Revolutionary Action was held on 24 January 1915 when Mussolini declared that it was necessary for Europe to resolve its national problems including national borders—of Italy and elsewhere, "...for the ideals of justice and liberty for which oppressed peoples must acquire the right to belong to those national communities from which they descended." Attempts to hold mass meetings were ineffective and the organization was regularly harassed by government authorities and socialists. Similar political ideas arose in Germany after the outbreak of the war. German sociologist Johann Plenge spoke of the rise of a national socialism in Germany within what he termed the ideas of 1914 that were a declaration of war against the ideas of 1789 the French Revolution according to Plenge the ideas of 1789 that included rights of man democracy individualism and liberalism were being rejected in favor of the ideas of 1914 that included German values 
of duty, discipline, law and order. Plenge believed that racial solidarity Volksgemeinschaft would replace class division and that racial comrades would unite to create a socialist society in the struggle of proletarian Germany against capitalist Britain. He believed that the spirit of 1914 manifested itself in the concept of the People's League of National Socialism. This national socialism was a form of state socialism that rejected the idea of boundless freedom and promoted an economy that would serve the whole of Germany under the leadership of the state. This national socialism was opposed to capitalism because of the components that were against the national interest of Germany, but insisted that national socialism would strive for greater efficiency in the economy. Plenge advocated an authoritarian rational ruling elite to develop national socialism through a hierarchical technocratic state. Impact of World War I Fascists viewed World War I as bringing revolutionary changes in the nature of war, society, the state and technology, as the advent of total war and mass mobilization had broken down the distinction between civilian and combatant, as civilians had become a critical part in economic production for the war effort and thus arose a military citizenship, in which all citizens were involved to the military in some manner during the war. World War I had resulted in the rise of a powerful state capable of mobilizing millions of people to serve on the front lines or provide economic production and logistics to support those on the front lines, as well as having unprecedented authority to intervene in the lives of citizens. Fascists viewed technological developments of weaponry and the state's total mobilization of its population in the war as symbolizing the beginning of a new era fusing state power with mass politics, technology and particularly the mobilizing myth that they contended had triumphed over the myth of progress and the era of liberalism. <laughs> Impact of the Bolshevik Revolution The October Revolution of 1917—in which Bolshevik communists led by Vladimir Lenin seized power in Russia—greatly influenced the development of fascism. In 1917, Mussolini, as leader of the Fasci of Revolutionary Action, praised the October Revolution, but later he became unimpressed with Lenin, regarding him as merely a new version of Tsar Nicholas. After World War I, fascists have commonly campaigned on anti Marxist agendas. Liberal opponents of both fascism and the Bolsheviks argue that there are various similarities between the two, including that they believed in the necessity of a vanguard leadership, had disdain for bourgeois values, and it is argued had totalitarian ambitions. In practice, both have commonly emphasized revolutionary action, proletarian nation theories, one party states, and party armies. However, both draw clear distinctions from each other both in aims and tactics, with the Bolsheviks emphasizing the need for an organized participatory democracy and an egalitarian, internationalist vision for society while the fascists emphasize hyper-nationalism and open hostility towards democracy, envisioning a hierarchical social structure as essential to their aims. With the antagonism between anti-interventionist Marxists and pro-interventionist fascists complete by the end of the war, the two sides became irreconcilable. The fascists presented themselves as anti-Marxists and as opposed to the Marxists. Mussolini consolidated control over the fascist movement, known as Sansepolcrismo, in 1919 with the founding of the Fasci Italiani di Combattimento. The Fascist Manifesto of 1919 In 1919, Alcist de Ambris and futurist movement leader Filippo Tommaso Marinetti created the Manifesto of the Italian Fasci of Combat, the Fascist Manifesto. The Manifesto was presented on 6 June 1919 in the fascist newspaper Il Popolo d'Italia. The manifesto supported the creation of universal suffrage for both men and women the latter being realized only partly in late 1925, with all opposition parties banned or disbanded, proportional representation on a regional basis, government representation through a corporatist system of national councils of experts, selected from professionals and tradespeople, elected to represent and hold legislative power over their respective areas, including labor, industry, transportation, public health, communications, etc., and the abolition of the Italian Senate. 
The manifesto supported the creation of an eight-hour work day for all workers, a minimum wage, worker representation in industrial management, equal confidence in labor unions as in industrial executives and public servants, reorganization of the transportation sector, revision of the draft law on invalidity insurance, reduction of the retirement age from 65 to 55, a strong progressive tax on capital, confiscation of the property of religious institutions and abolishment of bishoprics, and revision of military contracts contracts to allow the government to seize 85% of profits. It also called for the fulfillment of expansionist aims in the Balkans and other parts of the Mediterranean, the creation of a short-service national militia to serve defensive duties, nationalization of the armaments industry and a foreign policy designed to be peaceful but also competitive. The next events that influenced the fascists in Italy was the raid of Fiume by Italian nationalist Gabriele D'Annunzio and the founding of the Charter of Carnero in 1920. D'Annunzio and De Ambris designed the charter, which advocated national syndicalist corporatist productionism alongside D'Annunzio's political views. Many fascists saw the charter of Carnero as an ideal constitution for a fascist Italy. This behavior of aggression towards Yugoslavia and South Slavs was pursued by Italian fascists with their persecution of South Slavs—especially Slovenes and Croats. Topic. Italian fascists in 1920 In 1920, militant strike activity by industrial workers reached its peak in Italy and 1919 and 1920 were known as the Red Years. Mussolini and the fascists took advantage of the situation by allying with industrial businesses and attacking workers and peasants in the name of preserving order and internal peace in Italy. Fascists identified their primary opponents as the majority of socialists on the left who had opposed intervention in World War I. The fascists and the Italian political right held common ground, both held Marxism in contempt, discounted class consciousness, and believed in the rule of elites. The fascists assisted the anti-socialist campaign by allying with the other parties and the conservative right in a mutual effort to destroy the Italian Socialist Party and labor organizations committed to class identity above national identity. Fascism sought to accommodate Italian conservatives by making major alterations to its political agenda. Abandoning its previous populism, republicanism and anti-clericalism, adopting policies in support of free enterprise and accepting the Catholic Church and the monarchy as institutions in Italy. To appeal to Italian conservatives, fascism adopted policies such as promoting family values, including promotion policies designed to reduce the number of women in the workforce limiting the woman's role to that of a mother. The fascists banned literature on birth control and increased penalties for abortion in 1926, declaring both crimes against the state. Though fascism adopted a number of anti-modern positions designed to appeal to people upset with the new trends in sexuality and women's rights, especially those with a reactionary point of view, the fascists sought to maintain fascism's revolutionary character, with Angelo Olivero Olivetti saying, "...fascism would like to be conservative, but it will be by being revolutionary." The fascists supported revolutionary action and committed to secure law and order to appeal to both conservatives and syndicalists. Prior to fascism's accommodations to the political right, fascism was a small, urban, northern Italian movement that had about a thousand members. After fascism's accommodation of the political right, the fascist movement's membership soared to approximately 250,000 by 1921. Topic. Fascist violence in 1922 Beginning in 1922, fascist paramilitaries escalated their strategy from one of attacking socialist offices and homes of socialist leadership figures to one of violent occupation of cities. The fascists met little serious resistance from authorities and proceeded to take over several northern Italian cities. The fascists attacked the headquarters of socialist and Catholic labor unions in Cremona and imposed forced Italianization upon the German-speaking population of Trent and Balzano. After seizing these cities, the fascists made plans to take Rome. On 24 October 1922, the fascist party held its annual congress in Naples, where Mussolini ordered blackshirts to take control of public buildings and trains and to converge on three points around Rome. The fascists managed to seize control of several post offices and trains in northern Italy while the Italian government, led by a left-wing coalition, was internally divided and unable to respond to the fascist advances. 
King Victor Emmanuel III of Italy perceived the risk of bloodshed in Rome in response to attempting to disperse the fascists to be too high. Victor Emmanuel III decided to appoint Mussolini as Prime Minister of Italy and Mussolini arrived in Rome on 30 October to accept the appointment. Fascist propaganda aggrandized this event, known as March on Rome, as a seizure of power because of fascists' heroic exploits. <laughs> Fascist Italy Historian Stanley G. Payne says fascism in Italy was a primarily political dictatorship. The fascist party itself had become almost completely bureaucratized and subservient to, not dominant over, the state itself. Big business, industry, and finance retained extensive autonomy, particularly in the early years. The armed forces also enjoyed considerable autonomy. The fascist militia was placed under military control. The judicial system was left largely intact and relatively autonomous as well. The police continued to be directed by state officials and were not taken over by party leaders. Nor was a major new police elite created. There was never any question of bringing the church under overall subservience. Sizable sectors of Italian cultural life retained extensive autonomy, and no major state propaganda and culture ministry existed. The Mussolini regime was neither especially sanguinary nor particularly repressive. <inaudible> Mussolini in power Upon being appointed Prime Minister of Italy, Mussolini had to form a coalition government because the fascists did not have control over the Italian parliament. Mussolini's coalition government initially pursued economically liberal policies under the direction of Liberal Finance Minister Alberto Di Stefani, a member of the Centre Party, including balancing the budget through deep cuts to the civil service. Initially, little drastic change in government policy had occurred and repressive police actions were limited. The fascists began their attempt to entrench fascism in Italy with the Acerbo Law, which guaranteed a plurality of the seats in parliament to any party or coalition list in an election that received 25% or more of the vote. Through considerable fascist violence and intimidation, the list won a majority of the vote, allowing many seats to go to the fascists. In the aftermath of the election, a crisis and political scandal erupted after Socialist Party deputy Giacomo Matteotti was kidnapped and murdered by a fascist. The liberals and the leftist minority in parliament walked out in protest in what became known as the Aventine Secession. On 3 January 1925, Mussolini addressed the fascist-dominated Italian parliament and declared that he was personally responsible for what happened, but insisted that he had done nothing wrong. Mussolini proclaimed himself dictator of Italy, assuming full responsibility over the government and announcing the dismissal of parliament. From 1925 to 1929, fascism steadily became entrenched in power, opposition deputies were denied access to parliament, censorship was introduced and a December 1925 decree made Mussolini solely responsible to the king. Catholic Church. In 1929, the fascist regime briefly gained what was in effect a blessing of the Catholic Church after the regime signed a concordat with the Church, known as the Lateran Treaty, which gave the papacy state sovereignty and financial compensation for the seizure of church lands by the liberal state in the 19th century, but within two years the Church had renounced fascism in the encyclical Non Abbiamo Bassano as a pagan idolatry of the state, which teaches hatred, violence and irreverence. Not long after signing the agreement, by Mussolini's own confession the Church had threatened to have him excommunicated, in part because of his intractable nature and that he had "...confiscated more issues of Catholic newspapers in the next three months than in the previous seven years." By the late 1930s, Mussolini became more vocal in his anti-clerical rhetoric, repeatedly denouncing the Catholic Church and discussing ways to depose the Pope. He took the position that the papacy was a malignant tumor in the body of Italy and must be rooted out once and for all, because there was no room in Rome for both the Pope and himself. 
In her 1974 book, Mussolini's widow Rachel stated that her husband had always been an atheist until near the end of his life, writing that her husband was basically irreligious until the later years of his life. The National Socialists of Germany employed similar anti clerical policies. The Gestapo confiscated hundreds of monasteries in Austria and Germany, evicted clergymen and laymen alike, and often replaced crosses with a swastikas. Referring to the swastika as the Devil's Cross, church leaders found their youth organizations banned, their meetings limited and various Catholic periodicals censored or banned. Government officials eventually found it necessary to place Nazis into editorial positions in the Catholic press. Up to 2,720 clerics, mostly Catholics, were arrested by the Gestapo and imprisoned inside of Germany's Dachau concentration camp, resulting in over 1,000 deaths. Corporatist economic system The fascist regime created a corporatist economic system in 1925 with creation of the Palazzo Vidioni Pact, in which the Italian Employers' Association Confindustria and fascist trade unions agreed to recognize each other as the sole representatives of Italy's employers and employees, excluding non-fascist trade unions. The fascist regime first created a ministry of corporations that organized the Italian economy into 22 sectoral corporations, banned workers' strikes and lockouts, and in 1927 created the Charter of Labor, which established workers' rights and duties and created labor tribunals to arbitrate employer employee disputes. In practice, the sectoral corporations exercised little independence and were largely controlled by the regime and employee organizations were rarely led by employees themselves, but instead by appointed fascist party members. <laughs> <laughs> Aggressive foreign policy In the 1920s, fascist Italy pursued an aggressive foreign policy that included an attack on the Greek island of Corfu, aims to expand Italian territory in the Balkans, plans to wage war against Turkey and Yugoslavia, attempts to bring Yugoslavia into civil war by supporting Croat and Macedonian separatists to legitimize Italian intervention and making Albania a de facto protectorate of Italy, which was achieved through diplomatic means by 1927. In response to revolt in the Italian colony of Libya, fascist Italy abandoned previous liberal-era colonial policy of cooperation with local leaders. Instead, claiming that Italians were a superior race to African races and thereby had the right to colonize the «inferior» Africans, it sought to settle 10 to 15 million Italians in Libya. This resulted in an aggressive military campaign known as the pacification of Libya against natives in Libya, including mass killings, the use of concentration camps and the forced starvation of thousands of people. Italian authorities committed ethnic cleansing by forcibly expelling 100,000 Bedouin Cyrenaicans, half the population of Cyrenaica in Libya, from their settlements that was slated to be given to Italian settlers. Hitler adopts Italian model The March on Rome brought fascism international attention. One early admirer of the Italian fascists was Adolf Hitler, who less than a month after the march had begun to model himself and the Nazi party upon Mussolini and the fascists. The Nazis, led by Hitler and the German war hero Erich Ludendorff, attempted a «march on Berlin» modeled upon the March on Rome, which resulted in the failed Beer Hall Putsch in Munich in November 1923. <laughs> <laughs> International impact of the Great Depression and the build-up to World War II The conditions of economic hardship caused by the Great Depression brought about an international surge of social unrest. According to historian Philip Morgan, the onset of the Great Depression dot was the greatest stimulus yet to the diffusion and expansion of fascism outside Italy." Fascist propaganda blamed the problems of the Long Depression of the 1930s on minorities and scapegoats, Judeo-Masonic Bolshevik conspiracies, left-wing internationalism and the presence of immigrants. In Germany, it contributed to the rise of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, which resulted in the demise of the Weimar Republic and the establishment of the fascist regime, Nazi Germany, under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. 
With the rise of Hitler and the Nazis to power in 1933, liberal democracy was dissolved in Germany and the Nazis mobilized the country for war, with expansionist territorial aims against several countries. In the 1930s, the Nazis implemented racial laws that deliberately discriminated against, disenfranchised and persecuted Jews and other racial and minority groups. Fascist movements grew in strength elsewhere in Europe. Hungarian fascist Gyula Gombos rose to power as Prime Minister of Hungary in 1932 and attempted to entrench his party of national unity throughout the country. He created an eight-hour work day, a 48-hour work week in industry and sought to entrench a corporatist economy, and pursued irredentist claims on Hungary's neighbours. The fascist Iron Guard movement in Romania soared in political support after 1933, gaining representation in the Romanian government and an Iron Guard member assassinated Romanian Prime Minister Ion Duca. During the 6 February 1934 crisis, France faced the greatest domestic political turmoil since the Dreyfus Affair when the fascist Francist movement and multiple far-right movements rioted en masse in Paris against the French government resulting in major political violence. A variety of para-fascist governments that borrowed elements from fascism were formed during the Great Depression, including those of Greece, Lithuania, Poland and Yugoslavia. In the Americas, the Brazilian integralists led by Plinio Salgado claimed as many as 200,000 members although following coup attempts it faced a crackdown from the Estado Novo of Getulio Vargas in 1937. In the 1930s, the National Socialist Movement of Chile gained seats in Chile's parliament and attempted a coup d'état that resulted in the Seguro Obrero massacre of 1938. During the Great Depression, Mussolini promoted active state intervention in the economy. He denounced the contemporary supercapitalism that he claimed began in 1914 as a failure because of its alleged decadence, its support for unlimited consumerism, and its intention to create the standardization of humankind. Fascist Italy created the Institute for Industrial Reconstruction IRI, a giant state-owned firm and holding company that provided state funding to failing private enterprises. The IRI was made a permanent institution in Fascist Italy in 1937, pursued fascist policies to create national autarky and had the power to take over private firms to maximize war production. While Hitler's regime only nationalized 500 companies in key industries by the early 1940s, Mussolini declared in 1934 that t hree fourths of Italian economy, industrial and agricultural, is in the hands of the state. Due to the worldwide depression, Mussolini's government was able to take over most of Italy's largest failing banks, who held controlling interest in many Italian businesses. The Institute for Industrial Reconstruction, a state-operated holding company in charge of bankrupt banks and companies, reported in early 1934 that they held assets of 48.5% of the share capital of Italy, which later included the capital of the banks themselves. Political historian Martin Blinkhorn estimated Italy's scope of state intervention and ownership greatly surpassed that in Nazi Germany, giving Italy a public sector second only to that of Stalin's Russia. In the late 1930s, Italy enacted manufacturing cartels, tariff barriers, currency restrictions and massive regulation of the economy to attempt to balance payments. Italy's policy of autarky failed to achieve effective economic autonomy. Nazi Germany similarly pursued an economic agenda with the aims of autarky and rearmament and imposed protectionist policies, including forcing the German steel industry to use lower quality German iron ore rather than superior quality imported iron. Topic: World War II, 1939 to 1945. In fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, both Mussolini and Hitler pursued territorial expansionist and interventionist foreign policy agendas from the 1930s through the 1940s, culminating in World War II. Mussolini called for irredentist Italian claims to be reclaimed, establishing Italian domination of the Mediterranean Sea and securing Italian access to the Atlantic Ocean and the creation of Italian Spazio Vitale vital space, in the Mediterranean and Red Sea regions. Hitler called for irredentist German claims to be reclaimed along with the creation of German Lebensraum living space, in Eastern Europe, including territories held by the Soviet Union, that would be colonized by Germans. From 1935 to 1939, Germany and Italy escalated their demands for territorial claims and greater influence in world affairs. 
Italy invaded Ethiopia in 1935 resulting in its condemnation by the League of Nations and its widespread diplomatic isolation. In 1936, Germany remilitarized the industrial Rhineland, a region that had been ordered demilitarized by the Treaty of Versailles. In 1938, Germany annexed Austria and Italy assisted Germany in resolving the diplomatic crisis between Germany versus Britain and France over claims on Czechoslovakia by arranging the Munich Agreement that gave Germany the Sudetenland and was perceived at the time to have averted a European war. These hopes faded when Hitler violated the Munich Agreement by ordering the invasion and partition of Czechoslovakia between Germany and a client state of Slovakia in 1939. At the same time from 1938 to 1939, Italy was demanding territorial and colonial concessions from France and Britain. In 1939, Germany prepared for war with Poland, but attempted to gain territorial concessions from Poland through diplomatic means. The Polish government did not trust Hitler's promises and refused to accept Germany's demands. The invasion of Poland by Germany was deemed unacceptable by Britain, France, and their allies, resulting in their mutual declaration of war against Germany that was deemed the aggressor in the war in Poland, resulting in the outbreak of World War II. In 1940, Mussolini led Italy into World War II on the side of the Axis. Mussolini was aware that Italy did not have the military capacity to carry out a long war with France or the United Kingdom and waited until France was on the verge of imminent collapse and surrender from the German invasion before declaring war on France and the United Kingdom on 10 June 1940 on the assumption that the war would be short-lived following France's collapse. Mussolini believed that following a brief entry of Italy into war with France, followed by the imminent French surrender, Italy could gain some territorial concessions from France and then concentrate its forces on a major offensive in Egypt where British and Commonwealth forces were outnumbered by Italian forces. Plans by Germany to invade the United Kingdom in 1940 failed after Germany lost the aerial warfare campaign in the Battle of Britain. In 1941, the Axis campaign spread to the Soviet Union after Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa. Axis forces at the height of their power controlled almost all of continental Europe. The war became prolonged—contrary to Mussolini's plans—resulting in Italy losing battles on multiple fronts and requiring German assistance. During World War II, the Axis powers in Europe led by Nazi Germany participated in the extermination of millions of Poles, Jews, Gypsies and others in the genocide known as the Holocaust. After 1942, Axis forces began to falter. In 1943, after Italy faced multiple military failures, the complete reliance and subordination of Italy to Germany, the Allied invasion of Italy and the corresponding international humiliation, Mussolini was removed as head of government and arrested on the order of King Victor Emmanuel III, who proceeded to dismantle the fascist state and declared Italy's switching of allegiance to the Allied side. Mussolini was rescued from arrest by German forces and led the German client state, the Italian Social Republic from 1943 to 1945. Nazi Germany faced multiple losses and steady Soviet and Western Allied offensives from 1943 to 1945. On 28 April 1945, Mussolini was captured and executed by Italian communist partisans. On 30 April 1945, Hitler committed suicide. Shortly afterwards, Germany surrendered and the Nazi regime was systematically dismantled by the occupying Allied powers. An international military tribunal was subsequently convened in Nuremberg. Beginning in November 1945 and lasting through 1949, numerous Nazi political, military and economic leaders were tried and convicted of war crimes, with many of the worst offenders receiving the death penalty. Topic: Post World War II, 1945 present. The victory of the Allies over the Axis powers in World War II led to the collapse of many fascist regimes in Europe. The Nuremberg trials convicted several Nazi leaders of crimes against humanity involving the Holocaust. However, there remained several movements and governments that were ideologically related to fascism. Francisco Franco's phalangist one-party state in Spain was officially neutral during World War II and it survived the collapse of the Axis powers. Franco's rise to power had been directly assisted by the militaries of fascist Italy and Nazi Germany during the Spanish Civil War and Franco had sent volunteers to fight on the side of Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union during World War II. 
The first years were characterized by a repression against the anti-fascist ideologies, a deep censorship and the suppression of democratic institutions elected parliament, constitution of 1931, regional statutes of autonomy. After World War II and a period of international isolation, Franco's regime normalized relations with the Western powers during the Cold War, until Franco's death in 1975 and the transformation of Spain into a liberal democracy. Historian Robert Paxton observes that one of the main problems in defining fascism is that it was widely mimicked. Paxton says, in fascism's heyday, in the 1930s, many regimes that were not functionally fascist borrowed elements of fascist décor in order to lend themselves an aura of force, vitality, and mass mobilization." He goes on to observe that Salazar, "...crushed Portuguese fascism after he had copied some of its techniques of popular mobilization." Portugal was under the control of the Estado Novo, a dictatorship led by Antonio de Oliveira Salazar. In Argentina, Peronism, associated with the regime of Juan Perón from 1946 to 1955 and 1973 to 1974, was influenced by fascism. Between 1939 and 1941, prior to his rise to power, Perón had developed a deep admiration of Italian fascism and modeled his economic policies on Italian fascist policies. The term neo fascism refers to fascist movements after World War II. In Italy, the Italian social movement led by Giorgio Almiranti was a major neo-fascist movement that transformed itself into a self-described post-fascist movement called the National Alliance and, which has been an ally of Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia for a decade. In 2008, and joined Forza Italia in Berlusconi's new party The People of Freedom, but in 2012 a group of politicians split from The People of Freedom, refounding the party with the name Brothers of Italy. In Germany, various neo-Nazi movements have been formed and banned in accordance with Germany's constitutional law which forbids Nazism. The National Democratic Party of Germany NPD is widely considered a neo-Nazi party, although the party does not publicly identify itself as such. After the onset of the Great Recession and economic crisis in Greece, a movement known as the Golden Dawn, widely considered a neo-Nazi party, soared in support out of obscurity and won seats in Greece's parliament, espousing a staunch hostility towards minorities, illegal immigrants and refugees. In 2013, after the murder of an anti-fascist musician by a person with links to Golden Dawn, the Greek government ordered the arrest of Golden Dawn's leader Nikolaos Michaeloliakos and other Golden Dawn members on charges related to being associated with a criminal organization. Tenets <inaudible> 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 Robert O. Paxton finds that the transformations undertaken by fascists in power were "...profound enough to be called revolutionary." They "...often set fascists into conflict with conservatives rooted in families, churches, social rank, and property." Paxton argues, F. Ashism redrew the frontiers between private and public, sharply diminishing what had once been untouchably private. It changed the practice of citizenship from the enjoyment of constitutional rights and duties to participation in mass ceremonies of affirmation and conformity. It reconfigured relations between the individual and the collectivity, so that an individual had no rights outside community interest. It expanded the powers of the executive—party and state—in a bid for total control. Finally, it unleashed aggressive emotions hitherto known in Europe only during war or social revolution. Nationalism Ultranationalism combined with the myth of national rebirth is a key foundation of fascism. Dylan Riley argues that in Italy in the early 1920s, neither organized socialism nor the Italian liberals championed the democratic demands of the left nationalists. Fascism stepped into this vacuum, constituting itself as an anti-socialist and anti-liberal civil society movement. It was the failure of this counter-hegemonic movement that would lead to the fascist seizure of power. Veterans' organizations are the clearest manifestation of civic mobilization in post-war Italy. The fascist view of a nation is of a single organic entity that binds people together by their ancestry and is a natural unifying force of people. 
Fascism seeks to solve economic, political and social problems by achieving a millenarian national rebirth, exalting the nation or race above all else and promoting cults of unity, strength and purity. European fascist movements typically espouse a racist conception of non-Europeans being inferior to Europeans. Beyond this, fascists in Europe have not held a unified set of racial views. Historically, most fascists promoted imperialism, although there have been several fascist movements that were uninterested in the pursuit of new imperial ambitions. Topic: <laughs> Totalitarianism. Fascism promotes the establishment of a totalitarian state. It opposes liberal democracy, rejects multi-party systems and supports a one-party state. The doctrine of fascism states, "...the fascist conception of the state is all-embracing, outside of it no human or spiritual values can exist, much less have value. Thus understood, fascism is totalitarian, and the fascist state—a synthesis and a unit inclusive of all values—interprets, develops, and potentiates the whole life of a people." In The Legal Basis of the Total State, Nazi political theorist Karl Schmitt described the Nazi intention to form a "...strong state which guarantees a totality of political unity transcending all diversity," in order to avoid a "...disastrous pluralism tearing the German people apart." Fascist states pursued policies of social indoctrination through propaganda in education and the media and regulation of the production of educational and media materials. Education was designed to glorify the fascist movement and inform students of its historical and political importance to the nation. It attempted to purge ideas that were not consistent with the beliefs of the fascist movement and to teach students to be obedient to the state. Economy <inaudible> 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 Fascism presented itself as a third position, alternative to both international socialism and free market capitalism. While fascism opposed mainstream socialism, it sometimes regarded itself as a type of nationalist socialism to highlight their commitment to national solidarity and unity. Fascists opposed international free market capitalism, but supported a type of productive capitalism. Economic self sufficiency, known as autarky, was a major goal of most fascist governments. Fascist governments advocated resolution of domestic class conflict within a nation in order to secure national solidarity. This would be done through the state mediating relations between the classes, contrary to the views of classical liberal inspired capitalists. While fascism was opposed to domestic class conflict, it was held that bourgeois proletarian conflict existed primarily in national conflict between proletarian nations versus bourgeois nations. Fascism condemned what it viewed as widespread character traits that it associated as the typical bourgeois mentality that it opposed, such as materialism, crassness, cowardice, inability to comprehend the heroic ideal of the fascist warrior and associations with liberalism, individualism and parliamentarianism. In 1918, Mussolini defined what he viewed as the proletarian character, defining proletarian as being one and the same with producers, a productivist perspective that associated all people deemed productive, including entrepreneurs, technicians, workers and soldiers as being proletarian. He acknowledged the historical existence of both bourgeois and proletarian producers, but declared the need for bourgeois producers to merge with proletarian producers. While fascism denounced the mainstream internationalist and Marxist socialisms, it claimed to economically represent a type of nationalist productivist socialism that, while condemning parasitical capitalism, it was willing to accommodate productivist capitalism within it. This was derived from Henri de Saint-Simon, whose ideas inspired the creation of utopian socialism and influenced other ideologies, that stressed solidarity rather than class war and whose conception of productive people in the economy included both productive workers and productive bosses to challenge the influence of the aristocracy and unproductive financial speculators. Saint Simon's vision combined the traditionalist right wing criticisms of the French Revolution combined with a left wing belief in the need for association or collaboration of productive people in society. Whereas Marxism condemned capitalism as a system of exploitative property relations, fascism saw the nature of the control of credit and money in the contemporary capitalist system as abusive. Unlike Marxism, fascism did not see class conflict between the Marxist-defined proletariat and the bourgeoisie as a given or as an engine of historical materialism. 
Instead, it viewed workers and productive capitalists in common as productive people who were in conflict with parasitic elements in society including, corrupt political parties, corrupt financial capital and feeble people. Fascist leaders such as Mussolini and Hitler spoke of the need to create a new managerial elite led by engineers and captains of industry—but free from the parasitic leadership of industries. Hitler stated that the Nazi party supported Bodenstandigen Kapitalismus productive capitalism", that was based upon profit earned from one's own labor, but condemned unproductive capitalism or loan capitalism, which derived profit from speculation. Fascist economics supported a state-controlled economy that accepted a mix of private and public ownership over the means of production. Economic planning was applied to both the public and private sector and the prosperity of private enterprise depended on its acceptance of synchronizing itself with the economic goals of the state. Fascist economic ideology supported the profit motive, but emphasized that industries must uphold the national interest as superior to private profit. While fascism accepted the importance of material wealth and power, it condemned materialism, which identified as being present in both communism and capitalism, and criticized materialism for lacking acknowledgement of the role of the spirit. In particular, fascists criticized capitalism not because of its competitive nature nor support of private property, which fascists supported but due to its materialism, individualism, alleged bourgeois decadence and alleged indifference to the nation. Fascism denounced Marxism for its advocacy of materialist internationalist class identity, which fascists regarded as an attack upon the emotional and spiritual bonds of the nation and a threat to the achievement of genuine national solidarity. In discussing the spread of fascism beyond Italy, historian Philip Morgan states, since the Depression was a crisis of laissez-faire capitalism and its political counterpart, parliamentary democracy, fascism could pose as the third way alternative between capitalism and Bolshevism, the model of a new European civilization. As Mussolini typically put it in early 1934, from 1929, Fascism has become a universal phenomenon. The dominant forces of the 19th century, democracy, socialism, liberalism have been exhausted. The new political and economic forms of the 20th century are fascist Mussolini 1935-32. Fascists criticized egalitarianism as preserving the weak, and they instead promoted social Darwinist views and policies. They were in principle opposed to the idea of social welfare, arguing that it encouraged the preservation of the degenerate and the feeble." The Nazi party condemned the welfare system of the Weimar Republic, as well as private charity and philanthropy, for supporting people whom they regarded as racially inferior and weak, and who should have been weeded out in the process of natural selection. Nevertheless, faced with the mass unemployment and poverty of the Great Depression, the Nazis found it necessary to set up charitable institutions to help racially pure Germans in order to maintain popular support, while arguing that this represented racial self-help and not indiscriminate charity or universal social welfare. Thus, Nazi programs such as the Winter Relief of the German People and the broader National Socialist People's Welfare NSV were organized as quasi-private institutions, officially relying on private donations from Germans to help others of their race, although in practice those who refused to donate could face severe consequences. Unlike the social welfare institutions of the Weimar Republic and the Christian Charities, the NSV distributed assistance on explicitly racial grounds. It provided support only to those who were "...racially sound, capable of and willing to work, politically reliable, and willing and able to reproduce." Non-Aryans were excluded, as well as the "...work shy," asocials, and the "...hereditarily ill." Under these conditions, by 1939, over 17 million Germans had obtained assistance from the NSV, and the agency "...projected a powerful image of caring and support." For those who were judged to have got into difficulties through no fault of their own. Yet the organization was feared and disliked among society's poorest because it resorted to intrusive questioning and monitoring to judge who was worthy of support. Action Fascism emphasizes direct action, including supporting the legitimacy of political violence, as a core part of its politics. Fascism views violent action as a necessity in politics that fascism identifies as being an endless struggle. 
This emphasis on the use of political violence means that most fascist parties have also created their own private militias e.g. the Nazi Party's brown shirts and fascist Italy's black shirts. The basis of fascism's support of violent action in politics is connected to social Darwinism. Fascist movements have commonly held social Darwinist views of nations, races and societies. They say that nations and races must purge themselves of socially and biologically weak or degenerate people, while simultaneously promoting the creation of strong people, in order to survive in a world defined by perpetual national and racial conflict. Age and gender roles Fascism emphasizes youth both in a physical sense of age and in a spiritual sense as related to virility and commitment to action. The Italian fascists' political anthem was called Giovanezza, the youth. Fascism identifies the physical age period of youth as a critical time for the moral development of people who will affect society. Walter Lacker argues that the corollaries of the cult of war and physical danger were the cult of brutality, strength, and sexuality. Fascism is a true counter civilization, rejecting the sophisticated rationalist humanism of old Europe. Fascism sets up as its ideal the primitive instincts and primal emotions of the barbarian. Italian fascism pursued what it called moral hygiene of youth, particularly regarding sexuality. Fascist Italy promoted what it considered normal sexual behavior in youth while denouncing what it considered deviant sexual behavior. It condemned pornography, most forms of birth control and contraceptive devices with the exception of the condom, homosexuality and prostitution as deviant sexual behavior, although enforcement of laws opposed to such practices was erratic and authorities often turned a blind eye. Fascist Italy regarded the promotion of male sexual excitation before puberty as the cause of criminality amongst male youth, declared homosexuality a social disease and pursued an aggressive campaign to reduce prostitution of young women. Mussolini perceived women's primary role as primarily child bearers and men, warriors, once saying, "War is to man what maternity is to the woman." In an effort to increase birth rates, the Italian fascist government gave financial incentives to women who raised large families and initiated policies intended to reduce the number of women employed. Italian fascism called for women to be honored as reproducers of the nation, and the Italian fascist government held ritual ceremonies to honor women's role within the Italian nation. In 1934, Mussolini declared that employment of women was a major aspect of the thorny problem of unemployment, and that for women, working was incompatible with childbearing. Mussolini went on to say that the solution to unemployment for men was the exodus of women from the workforce. The German Nazi government strongly encouraged women to stay at home to bear children and keep house. This policy was reinforced by bestowing the cross of honor of the German mother on women bearing four or more children. The unemployment rate was cut substantially, mostly through arms production and sending women home so that men could take their jobs. Nazi propaganda sometimes promoted premarital and extramarital sexual relations, unwed motherhood and divorce, but at other times the Nazis opposed such behavior. The Nazis decriminalized abortion in cases where fetuses had hereditary defects or were of a race the government disapproved of, while the abortion of healthy pure German, Aryan fetuses remained strictly forbidden. For non-Aryans, abortion was often compulsory. Their eugenics program also stemmed from the progressive biomedical model of Weimar Germany. In 1935, Nazi Germany expanded the legality of abortion by amending its eugenics law, to promote abortion for women with hereditary disorders. The law allowed abortion if a woman gave her permission and the fetus was not yet viable and for purposes of so-called racial hygiene, the Nazis said that homosexuality was degenerate, effeminate, perverted and undermined masculinity because it did not produce children. They considered homosexuality curable through therapy, citing modern scientism and the study of sexology, which said that homosexuality could be felt by normal people and not just an abnormal minority. Open homosexuals were interned in Nazi concentration camps. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Palingenesis and Modernism. Fascism emphasizes both palingenesis, national rebirth or recreation, and modernism. In particular, fascism's nationalism has been identified as having a palingenetic character. 
Fascism promotes the regeneration of the nation and purging it of decadence. Fascism accepts forms of modernism that it deems promotes national regeneration while rejecting forms of modernism that are regarded as antithetical to national regeneration. Fascism aestheticized modern technology and its association with speed, power and violence. Fascism admired advances in the economy in the early 20th century, particularly Fordism and scientific management. Fascist modernism has been recognized as inspired or developed by various figures such as Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, Ernst Junger, Gottfried Benn, Louis Ferdinand Céline, Knut Hamsun, Ezra Pound, and Wyndham Lewis. In Italy, such modernist influence was exemplified by Marinetti, who advocated a palingenetic modernist society that condemned liberal bourgeois values of tradition and psychology, while promoting a technological martial religion of national renewal that emphasized militant nationalism. In Germany, it was exemplified by Junger who was influenced by his observation of the technological warfare during World War I and claimed that a new social class had been created that he described as the warrior worker. Junger like Marinetti emphasized the revolutionary capacities of technology and emphasized an organic construction between human and machine as a liberating and regenerative force in that challenged liberal democracy, conceptions of individual autonomy, bourgeois nihilism and decadence. He conceived of a society based on a totalitarian concept of total mobilization of such disciplined warrior workers. Topic: <coughs> Criticism. Fascism has been widely criticized and condemned in modern times since the defeat of the Axis powers in World War II. Anti-democratic and tyrannical One of the most common and strongest criticisms of fascism is that it is a tyranny. Fascism is deliberately and entirely non-democratic and anti-democratic. Unprincipled opportunism Some critics of Italian fascism have said that much of the ideology was merely a byproduct of unprincipled opportunism by Mussolini and that he changed his political stances merely to bolster his personal ambitions while he disguised them as being purposeful to the public. Richard Washburn Child, the American ambassador to Italy who worked with Mussolini and became his friend and admirer, defended Mussolini's opportunistic behavior by writing. Opportunist is a term of reproach used to brand men who fit themselves to conditions for the reasons of self-interest. Mussolini, as I have learned to know him, is an opportunist in the sense that he believed that mankind itself must be fitted to changing conditions rather than to fixed theories, no matter how many hopes and prayers have been expended on theories and programs." Child quoted Mussolini as saying. The sanctity of an ism is not in the ism, it has no sanctity beyond its power to do, to work, to succeed in practice. It may have succeeded yesterday and fail tomorrow. Failed yesterday and succeed tomorrow. The machine first of all must run." Some have criticized Mussolini's actions during the outbreak of World War I as opportunist for seeming to suddenly abandon Marxist egalitarian internationalism for non-egalitarian nationalism and note to that effect that upon Mussolini endorsing Italy's intervention in the war against Germany and Austria-Hungary, he and the new fascist movement received financial support from foreign sources, such as Insaldo an armaments firm and other companies as well as the British security service MI5. Some, including Mussolini's socialist opponents at the time, have noted that regardless of the financial support he accepted for his pro-interventionist stance, Mussolini was free to write whatever he wished in his newspaper Il Popolo d'Italia without prior sanctioning from his financial backers. Furthermore, the major source of financial support that Mussolini and the fascist movement received in World War I was from France and is widely believed to have been French socialists who supported the French government's war against Germany and who sent support to Italian socialists who wanted Italian intervention on France's side. Mussolini's transformation away from Marxism into what eventually became fascism began prior to World War I, as Mussolini had grown increasingly pessimistic about Marxism and egalitarianism while becoming increasingly supportive of figures who opposed egalitarianism, such as Friedrich Nietzsche. By 1902, Mussolini was studying Georges Sorel, Nietzsche and Vilfredo Pareto. 
Sorel's emphasis on the need for overthrowing decadent liberal democracy and capitalism by the use of violence, direct action, general strikes and neo-Machiavellian appeals to emotion impressed Mussolini deeply. Mussolini's use of Nietzsche made him a highly unorthodox socialist, due to Nietzsche's promotion of elitism and anti-egalitarian views. Prior to World War I, Mussolini's writings over time indicated that he had abandoned the Marxism and egalitarianism that he had previously supported in favor of Nietzsche's Ubermensch concept and anti-egalitarianism. In 1908, Mussolini wrote a short essay called, Philosophy of Strength, based on his Nietzschean influence, in which Mussolini openly spoke fondly of the ramifications of an impending war in Europe in challenging both religion and nihilism. A new kind of free spirit will come, strengthened by the war. A spirit equipped with a kind of sublime perversity. A new free spirit will triumph over God and over nothing. Topic: Ideological dishonesty. Fascism has been criticized for being ideologically dishonest. Major examples of ideological dishonesty have been identified in Italian fascism's changing relationship with German Nazism. Fascist Italy's official foreign policy positions were known to commonly utilize rhetorical ideological hyperbole to justify its actions, although during Dino Grandi's tenure as Italy's foreign minister the country engaged in realpolitik free of such fascist hyperbole. Italian fascism's stance towards German Nazism fluctuated from support from the late 1920s to 1934, when it celebrated Hitler's rise to power and meeting with Hitler in 1934, to opposition from 1934 to 1936 after the assassination of Italy's allied leader in Austria, Engelbert Dollfuss, by Austrian Nazis, and again back to support after 1936, when Germany was the only significant power that did not denounce Italy's invasion and occupation of Ethiopia. After antagonism exploded between Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy over the assassination of Austrian Chancellor Dollfuss in 1934, Mussolini and Italian fascists denounced and ridiculed Nazism's racial theories, particularly by denouncing its Nordicism, while promoting Mediterraneanism. Mussolini himself responded to Nordicists' claims of Italy being divided into Nordic and Mediterranean racial areas due to Germanic invasions of northern Italy by claiming that while Germanic tribes such as the Lombards took control of Italy after the fall of ancient Rome, they arrived in small numbers about 8, and quickly assimilated into Roman culture and spoke the Latin language within 50 years. Italian fascism was influenced by the tradition of Italian nationalists scornfully looking down upon Nordicists' claims and taking pride in comparing the age and sophistication of ancient Roman civilization as well as the classical revival in the Renaissance to that of Nordic societies that Italian nationalists described as newcomers to civilization in comparison. At the height of antagonism between the Nazis and Italian fascists over race, Mussolini claimed that the Germans themselves were not a pure race and noted with irony that the Nazi theory of German racial superiority was based on the theories of non-German foreigners, such as Frenchman Arthur de Gobineau. After the tension in German-Italian relations diminished during the late 1930s, Italian fascism sought to harmonize its ideology with German Nazism and combined Nordicist and Mediterranean racial theories, noting that Italians were members of the Aryan race, composed of a mixed Nordic-Mediterranean subtype. In 1938, Mussolini declared upon Italy's adoption of anti-Semitic laws that Italian fascism had always been anti-Semitic. In fact, Italian fascism did not endorse anti-Semitism until the late 1930s. 30s when Mussolini feared alienating anti-Semitic Nazi Germany, whose power and influence were growing in Europe. Prior to that period there had been notable Jewish Italians who had been senior Italian fascist officials, including Margherita Sarfati, who had also been Mussolini's mistress. Also contrary to Mussolini's claim in 1938, only a small number of Italian fascists were staunchly anti-Semitic such as Roberto Farinacci and Giuseppe Preziosi, while others such as Italo Balbo, who came from Ferrara which had one of Italy's largest Jewish communities, were disgusted by the anti-Semitic laws and opposed them. Fascism scholar Mark Neoclius notes that while Italian fascism did not have a clear commitment to antisemitism, there were occasional antisemitic statements issued prior to 1938, such as Mussolini in 1919 declaring that the Jewish bankers in London and New York were connected by race to the Russian Bolsheviks and that 8% of the Russian Bolsheviks were Jews. <laughs> See also